providing you an overall framework for kind of the regulatory and policy um, uh, uh, regime that is currently in place that, that facilitates that scenario. Um, so before I turn it over to the guys at REG, I'll give you a quick background on, on what is going on at the federal level in terms of um, biofuels policy and, and how that can potentially inform the discussion today. Um, uh, by way of background, for, for more than a decade now, the federal government has had a program in place um, that, as I described before, savvy fuel retailers can take advantage of uh, to sell fuel at a lower price and to realize greater margins. And that program, of course, is the Renewable Fuel Standard. And as a practical matter, what, it, what that program does is it obligates every fuel refiner and importer to generate a certain volume of renewable fuel annually. Um, and in a minute or two, I'll talk about efforts to change which parties in the supply chain are um, obligated to generate the renewable fuel. But for right now, and hopefully for the foreseeable future, um, uh, every fuel refiner and fuel importer is obligated to generate renewable fuel. Um, and basically, these obligated parties have to attain a minimum number of renewable fuel credits, which are known as RINs. Um, and that's how they show that they're in compliance with the RFS program. And RINs are essentially an artificial commodity that can be bought and sold in an open market. Um, and the way it works in the real world, is, you know, many obligated parties are able to uh, generate their own renewable fuel. They do a lot of blending and, and they can generate RINs that way. Um, others are unable to directly generate their own mandatory volume of renewable fuel. And in those instances, they rely on others to introduce renewable fuel into commerce for them. And, and that kind of is where savvy retailers can come into play. Um, for truck stop operators, of course, the predominant renewable fuel that, that, that you can sell to take advantage of the RFS is uh, biomass-based diesel, uh, biodiesel, renewable diesel. Um, and, and essentially, the way that works is that biodiesel producers generate a biodiesel RIN for every gallon of biodiesel that they produce. Um, and as with any commodity, these RINs take on a value of their own, generally kind of reflecting the economics of blending biodiesel with diesel fuel. Um, and, and biodiesel producers can in turn sell biodiesel to biodiesel blenders who ultimately blend it with diesel fuel before it is sold to the motor republic. Um, of course, the question becomes what happens to that RIN that was generated by the biodiesel producer? Um, because every gallon of biodiesel has a valuable RIN credit associated with it, uh, the value of that RIN creates sufficient value to make biodiesel cheaper than diesel fuel. So upon blending biodiesel with diesel, a blender can separate the RINs from the uh, associated physical gallon of biodiesel and then sell that RIN credit to obligated parties, to refiners, that need them in order to meet their RFS mandates. Um, and the money generated from selling those RIN credits can enable retailers to pass savings onto their customers in the form of lower prices at the pump, yet at the same time make more money on account of the proceeds of those RIN sales. Um, alternatively, if a retailer for whatever reason is not inclined to actually blend biodiesel with diesel, um, the retailer can buy pre-blended product, B5, B10, B15, B20, what have you, um, and in that case, although the retailer would not own the associated ring credit, uh, the fact that the seller keeps the ring should enable the retailer to purchase that product at a discount to reflect the value that the seller is retaining with that ring credit. Um, you know, so in other words, the value of the ring should be baked in to the price of the product that the retailer purchases. Um, so that's a, a, a very quick high level of how the renewable fuel standard currently works. Um, there's an effort underway that NASA has been actively involved in, and those of you who diligently read our email updates probably know, uh, to change which entities in the supply chain are obligated parties under the RFS, from refiners 
they want to move it downstream to uh, to essentially entities that are wholesalers or byproduct at the rack or above the rack. Um, and, and that's something for a number of reasons that, not, that we don't need to get into right now, but at the end when we take questions, I'd be happy to talk about it more. Um, it's something that NATSO is actively opposing along with a number of other groups in, in Washington from uh, integrated refiners to uh, other marketing groups and, and renewable fuel producers. Um, uh, so it, it's a pretty wide coalition of, of folks who are opposing completely turning the RFS program on its head to require a lot of retailers to buy RINs rather than a lot of refiners to buy RINs. Um, uh, so there's a lot of action on that in the last month, and, and things are now have quieted down a little bit, hopefully for a while, but um, there's a lot of fluidity there, so stay tuned. Um, uh, on top of the RFS, there are some other federal policies that also incentivize uh, buying and blending biodiesel, namely the biodiesel tax credit. Um, this has been in place for a little more than a decade now. Um, it, it gives blenders a, a $1 a gallon credit for every uh, gallon of biodiesel that they blend into diesel fuel. Um, and and uh, it, it expired at the end of 2016. We are hopeful that we will get it extended again this year, retroactive to the beginning of the year. This has occurred several times over the last decade, but um, you know, for a while now, I've been saying that the biodiesel tax credit is defying gravity somewhat. And, and as you hear talk in Congress about comprehensive tax reform and efforts to simplify the tax code and eliminate a lot of kind of credits and deductions that corporations are able to take advantage of, and instead lower overall rates. I think the biodiesel tax credit is really in the line of fire there. Um, so we're still pushing for it to be extended, um, but at the same time, I, I, I wouldn't operate as though that was definitely gonna happen. Um, and my view, and I'd be curious to get John's take on this too, is, is basically that if the renewable fuel standard functions appropriately, it should somewhat accommodate the biodiesel tax credit lapsing, by which I mean that the value of the RIN that you generate by blending biodiesel should increase sufficiently so that in order to meet EPA's annual mandates, um, blenders will have the incentive to continue their blending operations and, and the RIN would basically bridge the gap that currently the $1 a gallon biodiesel tax credit provides. Um, so anyway, all of that being said, you all didn't you all didn't come in to listen to me rant and rave about policy. Uh, so um, I'll I'll stop for now. I'm happy to take questions at the end, but um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to John and, and the guys at REG. Yeah, th thanks, David. Just a, a quality control check. Can uh, David and Amy? Can you guys hear me? Okay. We can. And I've just put my screens uh, up on WebEx. Can you see those as well? We can. Okay, fantastic. I, I love it when the technology works. That's a, that's a good thing. So uh, good, good morning to everybody. Um, you know, first of all, thanks to David and Amy and the entire NASA team for the uh, opportunity to participate uh, in this uh, webinar today. It's something we're really excited about. Um, got a, you know, a great uh, attendance in terms of people uh, listening in as well, uh, which we're excited about. Um, I will do one additional shameless plug, uh, REG uh, and NATSO. Uh, are um, jointly conducting a, a study tour this summer uh, in Chicago. Once again, uh, as Amy said, refer to the uh, uh, NASA website for more information uh, about that. But it's going to be an opportunity to actually look at um, uh, a couple of uh, travel centers uh, in the Chicago area uh, that have put in biodiesel blending systems that have integrated biodiesel into their operation, uh, an opportunity to actually visit uh, one of REG's biodiesel plants uh, in the Chicagoland uh, area, uh, and then some great stuff around, uh, you know, retail, uh, in-store opportunities for, for travel centers as well. Um, and thanks everybody for, for taking the time to dial in this morning. So let me, let me jump into it. So David made some reference to this already. So Biodiesel has had, you know, strong and growing demand uh, for over, over 10 years now. Um, it was, however, as, as recent as uh, 2010, where the entire market for biodiesel uh, was only 300 million gallons. So that the catalyst for the dramatic growth that we've seen 
you know, really in the last seven years uh, has been the renewable fuel standard, and I'll talk a bit more about that, um, uh, went into, into effect uh, late 2010, uh, and that has really driven the volumes uh, significantly. We believe there was about 2.3 billion gallons of biodiesel consumed uh, domestically uh, in 2016. Uh, and with the increase in the RVOs associated with the RFS that I'll talk to in a, in a moment, uh, we expect that to continue. Um, you know, biodiesel today uh, is a, a mainstream fuel. You know, we're operating in a 60 billion gallon uh, a year distillate pool. You know, we're approaching four, uh, you know, hopefully 5% uh, market penetration now, uh, and it is broadly available. So uh, the availability of, of the product has, has changed dramatically, um, dramatically improved here particularly over the last five years. So travel centers across the country uh, have been some of the earliest uh, adopters of, of biodiesel. I did a, a bit of a lit search uh, last couple of days on Google preparing for this presentation. Uh, and, and you can see dating back to 2005 in particular, uh, a couple of the large national travel center chains um, beginning to express interest uh, and you know, entice suppliers. Uh, to supply them uh, with biodiesel. We've been supplying uh, travel centers with biodiesel since uh, 2006. Uh, I can share with you when, in 2016 alone, uh, we sold over 200 million gallons of biodiesel directly uh, to travel centers uh, across the country. Uh, and I'll show a map towards the end of, of the deck where some of our biorefineries are located. Um, customers you know, can either use their, uh, their own logistics capabilities to come in and pick up biodiesel uh, direct letter plants, or we can arrange fleet delivery um, from our facilities uh, directly to uh, travel centers that have, you know, put in uh, dedicated B100 tanks to be able to take need biodiesel. Uh, we also have the ability, as David mentioned, as well as others, uh, to deliver B5 to B20 and existing diesel tanks um, across the country. So the other slide I just wanted to show to kind of get things uh, kicked off here to show how mainstream biodiesel is, is becoming. And this was, once again, plucked from the National Biodiesel Board's website uh, a couple of days ago. And this contains a list of, uh, you know, what they call the, the biodiesel retail locations, B5 to B20 bins uh, located across the country. So it's C stores, travel centers, uh, agricultural uh, co-ops, uh, card locks. So it, I think the list is, is pretty incomplete, but uh, basically the, in, the intent of, of this slide was just to show, you know, it is nationwide. Uh, distribution uh, and coverage, you know, virtually in you know, any area uh, where there's significant uh, distillate supply, you know, particularly along the major uh, interstates, uh, biodiesel is being integrated uh, in, the, in the travel centers and, and C stores across the country. So I really wanted to focus uh, what I thought the, the NATSO members uh, wanted to, to hear about biodiesel in terms of uh, the economic impact that biodiesel can have. Uh, on the operations. So that, that opportunity to achieve additional margin from integration of biodiesel in your operations, you know, it, it's really a function of, of five different factors. You know, it's a function as what, what is the current price of, of diesel fuel, obviously. What can I purchase biodiesel for? As David alluded to at the beginning, you know, what are the value of, of biodiesel RINs? They're a huge part of the value proposition. Are there state incentives that I can take advantage of? Uh, and then finally, that blender's tax credit that you know, expired again uh, at the end of 2016, uh, what does that mean for me? Are there opportunities to participate uh, in that value when and if uh, that is reinstated uh, retroactively and, and going forward? So I, I wanted to start it with a, a very high level of overview of the state incentives. So there are a number, around a dozen or so across the country of states um, that either have a, a, a state requirement for blending of biodiesel uh, with, with diesel fuel uh, at certain levels, and, and Minnesota and, and Pennsylvania uh, are a couple examples of those. Um, there are a number of states that have financial incentives uh, to integrate biodiesel uh, into their operations, and Iowa, Illinois, Texas, uh, California, as well as some of the other Pacific Northwest states uh, looking at implementing the low carbon fuel standard uh, are a great uh, example of those. Um, so I'm going to talk more about RINs values and the blender's tax credit, um, and those tend to make blending economics profitable anywhere in the country. 
if you are able to take advantage of some of these additional state uh, incentives, uh, it tends to be a, a great opportunity, and that's where we see the highest adoption rate uh, of travel centers utilizing uh, biodiesel within their operations. So I wanted to give you a feel for, for four of those in just a, a bit more detail. So the state of Iowa, where, um, where I reside here, uh, actually has you know, one of the best incentives uh, in the country, uh, a combination of a retail tax credit uh, as well as a, a deferment uh, on the state tax for B11 blends and higher uh, creates a value of seven and a half cents per gallon uh, for every gallon of B11 that retailers uh, in Iowa sell. Uh, it's a great opportunity for them. The state of Illinois has one of the longest running uh, incentives in place. I believe it dates back to 2006 or seven. So virtually every diesel retailer, both C-Store and Truck Stop uh, in Illinois uh, has integrated uh, B11 uh, into their operations. They probably have the highest uh, penetration rate in terms of travel centers that have put in dedicated B100 tanks at their facilities uh, and biodiesel blending systems. Uh, it's a 6.25% uh, excise tax abatement. Uh, it's a very significant incentive, uh, once again, that virtually every retailer in Illinois is taking advantage of. <coughs> in Texas, there's a 20 cent uh, per gallon retailer incentive for every gallon of, of neat biodiesel, B99 or B100, uh, blended uh, into your diesel fuel. So as an example, if you're selling B10 uh, at the pump, um, that's a two cent per gallon incentive. Uh, if you're blending B20, uh, as a lot of, of retailers in Texas do, uh, particularly from this time of the year till October, November, when it's you know really, really warm in Texas, uh, that's a four cent per gallon uh, retailer incentive. And, and once again, uh, we have seen hundreds of uh, neat biodiesel tanks and biodiesel blending systems uh, put in place in the state of Texas uh, to take advantage of this. And then, and then finally, the one that we've really seen the biggest push on uh, over the last two to three years uh, is California uh, around the low carbon fuel standard. Um, very good carbon intensity scores uh, associated with biodiesel uh, has created tremendous value for integrating uh, both biodiesel and renewable diesel uh, into uh, travel center operations uh, in California. Um, and, and it's not just limited to California, Oregon and Washington uh, are looking at adopting that legislation. So uh, I think I'll demonstrate that, you know, economics exists to blend biodiesel virtually uh, anywhere in the country. Uh, the pot is sweetened significantly uh, if it happened to be one of these four or, you know, some of the other uh, half dozen states or so that have a state incentive. Uh, so talk specifically about Southern Illinois. Um, it's the, the longest running uh, in, incentive uh, you know, it's been a tremendous amount for uh, increasing the profitability of, of travel centers. And actually, I think it's a, it's a great model. Illinois is a, a cold weather state, um, particularly Chicago. Uh, I think it, it demonstrates uh, successfully uh, that you can utilize relatively high blend levels, uh, B11 year round. Uh, and, and once again, when there are positive blending economics, uh, many of the retailers uh, in Illinois, you know, blend up to B20 to take advantage of that B6 to B20 FTC dispenser labeling um, option that they have. So David made reference to this uh, already, and, and I wanted to get into it uh, as well. So the, the Blenders tax credit was first implemented back in, in 2005, and, and it was really intended to act as a catalyst for the build out of domestic biodiesel production uh, capacity and provide you know, a financial incentive uh, to allow biodiesel to be cost effective uh, and, and usually uh, less expensive than diesel fuel uh, to help retailers across the country uh, integrate it uh, into their options. So it has been in place every year since 2005. It has expired on three previous occasions. On all of those occasions, uh, it was reinstated retroactively back to the first of the year and extended uh, one year further out. So that's the situation we found ourselves in again on December 31st of, of 2016. Um, so we are pretty confident, uh, as, as I think uh, David is. I think David said he is hopeful. I, I'd say we're confident. Uh, there appears to be bipartisan support. Uh, this may be one of the few areas um, for this type of legislation uh, going forward. We think it will be reinstated retroactively back to January 1st of, of this year uh, and put in place uh, through 2018. 
And that's, that's important to the folks on the phone because there's an opportunity for you to share in the value. If you're buying biodiesel today uh, or before the Splinter's tax credit is reinstated, um, you need to be in discussions uh, with your fuel, with your biodiesel supplier about sharing in the value uh, if that blunders tax credit uh, when and if uh, it's reinstated. So the other large federal driver, as, as David mentioned as well, uh, has been the renewable fuel standards um, went into a place uh, as part of the independence, uh, Energy Independence Security Act uh, back in, in 2007. So what it replates, you know, it, it requires annual compliance requirements for four different categories uh, of renewable fuels, uh, traditional ethanol, biomass-based diesel, uh, advanced uh, biofuels, uh, and cellulosic ethanol. Biodiesel participates in two of those four categories, the biomass-based diesel category, uh, as well as the advanced biofuel category. Uh, so the RBOs uh, have been set for biomass-based diesel uh, for 2017, uh, and those continue to grow, those continue to create a, a tremendous opportunity uh, the compliance mechanism for each of those four categories of fuel uh, are RINs, um, biodiesel RINs, you know, come with the gallon. You get 1.5 RINs per gallon. Uh, they're a tremendous part uh, of the value proposition. So to make sure that you're getting, you know, fair value and maximizing your economics of integrating biodiesel in your operations, you need to understand the value of, of RINs uh, when you're either purchasing, you know, biodiesel neatly with the RINs uh, or as David said, there are options to buy uh, biodiesel without RINs as well. So we've seen a bit of a spike uh, in RINs values here. Uh, over the last week or so, a week to 10 days ago, biodiesel RINs were trading for uh, 90 cents a RIN. When I put this slide together uh, a couple of days ago, they were about a dollar per RIN uh, or a dollar 50 per gallon. Uh, so you can see uh, when, when you purchase that biodiesel gallon, uh, you get that RIN compliance mechanism as well, a very a huge part uh, of the value proposition. So I wanted to show a, a real life example and put this slide together uh, probably four or five days ago. And at the time, diesel fuel was a uh, buck sixty a gallon on the on the board. I think today it's closer to a buck forty nine or or buck fifty. Um, our REG plant price for, for neat biodiesel at that time was 125 over. Uh, so basically you could purchase biodiesel uh, FOB our plant for 285 a gallon. So with RINs at that dollar value times the 1.5 is a buck 50 per gallon. Basically your net biodiesel price uh, FOB plant was a buck 35 per gallon. You know compared to the buck 60 that's 25 cents per gallon of biodiesel blending economics. So that's before any state incentives are placed. So today, uh, you know, if you're in a regional proximity to a plant, uh, there still are positive biodiesel blending uh, economics and RINs values have actually increased here uh, over the last two or three days. Uh, so I think the economics are, are better than this. And then in addition, uh, I, I mentioned the Iowa State incentive. So at, at a B11 blend, the value of that 25 cents per gallon is around the 2.775 cents per gallon the state incentive is seven and a half cents a gallon. So in Iowa today, for every gallon of B11 that a C store or a truck stop sells, you know, there's over 10 cents a gallon uh, in, val in, in value uh, for a travel center uh, for every gallon of B11. So it, it is significant. And, and once again, let me make the point, this is all before any value of a retroactive blender's tax credit would be shared with the buyer. So I get asked all the time, okay, that's great. The economics look, look fantastic. You know, how, how do I do it? You know, what do I need to do? Um, what, what do I have to do to, to integrate, you know, biodiesel into my existing operations? Well, the, the short answer is, you know, you need to look at putting in a, a biodiesel blending system. Uh, so 10 years ago when we started, this was a relatively new concept. Uh, it's not today. Uh, hundreds, if not in the low thousands of these, have been implemented at travel centers uh, across the country. So the trend was clearly started by some of the large uh, national travel center chains. Um, a lot of the, the regional uh, and the, the, the independents uh, have started making these investments as well. So what it, it does is, is allows the, 
the travel centers, you know, to buy neat biodiesel uh, direct from the supplier, direct from somebody like REG, uh, and maximize their opportunity, you know, to participate in any value that they can capture from sharing in the blender's tax credit and maximize the, the value of the RINs um, rather than, you know, purchase a B5, B10, B15, B20 from a traditional fuel supplier uh, and their traditional fuel supplier keeping a lot of that value. So what, what it really means at the end of the day is you, you need to put in a, a dedicated, neat uh, biodiesel tank uh, alongside your existing diesel tanks uh, at your operation. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to break open your cement, which we, we all recognize is, is painful. So you're, you're typically gonna buy at least a 10,000 gallon tank because uh, obviously fuel is delivered in, in 7,000 gallon increments. You're gonna wanna pipe your, your, your existing diesel tank uh, to that neat bio tank, uh, put in a blending system that allows you to, to sell a B5, a B10, B15, B20. Um, and, and then there's telemetry that uh, a lot of our um, customers have put in over time that basically you know, allows them to adjust the blend level on, on the fly. So at this time of the year, as, as travel centers see it warming up you know, across the uh, upper Midwest, it's like, okay, it's gonna be the 60s and 70s, I'm okay to go from a B10 to a B15 to a B20, and just the opposite in, in the fall and winter, um, you know, basically can, can manage based on the weather, uh, or if blending economics are, are really positive, you wanna up your blend level, uh, maybe blending economics aren't as good, you wanna dial it back to, to a B5 or B10. So that, that telemetry allows folks to make those adjustments on the fly. So typically this is a, depending on, on what you have for your uh, existing site and, and how big a tank that you want to get, $150,000 to $250,000 capital investment. Uh, but for many folks, the paybacks on these tend to be in the six to eight to 18 month range. Uh, so uh, nearly everybody that we've worked with that has put one of these systems in place uh, has had a very good quick payback. So there are, are lots of uh, providers uh, of the tanks and the blending systems out there uh, we don't make specific uh, recommendations. Uh, we have relationships uh, in place with the numbers of those suppliers. Uh, so if you need a recommendation, uh, we can give you a, a list uh, and then let you guys choose uh, who you might want to work with. So if you don't want to initially make that investment uh, in, a, in a dedicated tank uh, and a blending system, uh, you can integrate B5 to B20 blends uh, directly with your number two ULS tanks uh, in, your, in your current operations. Uh, if you don't want to mess with the RINs, you have the option from buying from us and others B5 to B20 um, with, with, without RINs, uh, and we'll take care of managing those for you. Um, but you, you, you need to, you know, have discussions with the supplier uh, about the value of those RINs once and again um, because they're a huge part of the value proposition. So, you, you know, over the years, and, and this was more common historically, um, you know, lots of resistance to, to biodiesel. You know, what if my customers don't want it? So just wanted to uh, address some of the, the issues that we've seen over time. And the first is really around product performance. Um, and, and one of the things to remember is that there is no engine modifications necessary to run B5 to B20 blends or actually even higher blends of, of biodiesel uh, with this existing diesel engines, existing diesel engines. And there's also no modifications required uh, with your diesel tanks or with your dispensers uh, if you want to start with B5 to B20. If you do want to purchase the neat B100 and put a blending system, uh, as we mentioned, uh, there is a capital investment, uh, but it's easy to get started. Uh, there are very stringent uh, fuel specifications, ASTM specs uh, around biodiesel out there. Uh, biodiesel product quality uh, has improved over time. Uh, one of the advantages of biodiesel versus traditional number two LSD is higher cetane values. Uh, a number of our customers see uh, better performance with biodiesel because of that. With as low as B2 blends, uh, there is no requirement for a risk of the additive. Um, and the fuel efficiency studies, fuel efficiency studies that have been conducted uh, over the years show B20 uh, fuel efficiency uh, miles per gallon uh, equivalent to that of straight number two LSD. So one of the other misperceptions uh, over time that is being disproven is that, you know, I can't run biodiesel in the winter time or I need to run exceptionally low blends 
of biodiesel in, in the wintertime. Uh, so this is uh, Voyager's National Park. It's located uh, basically on the Minnesota-Canadian uh, border. Uh, it's really, really cold up there. It's still really cold up there right now. Um, you know, temperatures as low as, you know, 30 degrees below Fahrenheit are, are quite common. Uh, they have, for a number of years, uh, used B20 uh, year-round. Uh, and I think maybe a more relevant example to this audience is uh, Iowa and Illinois with those significant state incentives, once again, cold weather climates, uh, sea stores and truck stops are running B11 year round, uh, and then in the summertime, they're dialing it up to B20 to take advantage of the blending economics. So the, the other myth we hear a lot about is, you know, biodiesel is gonna, it's gonna clog my filters, it's gonna mess with my tanks, it's gonna, it's gonna clog my engines. Well, one of the properties of biodiesel uh, is it does act as a, as a natural solvent. And what it does in both, you know, biodiesel tanks uh, feeding into dispensers, uh, as well as engines, it cleans out that gunk and dirt and residue uh, that's built up uh, over time. So we do see often when folks first go to uh, a B2 or B5 and, and higher blends, some of that residue getting cleaned out uh, of their tanks uh, and their engines. Uh, and you do have to change filters a bit more frequently uh, at the very beginning. Uh, but after that, you have much cleaner, better running engines, much cleaner tanks uh, than you had historically. So that does have to be managed. Uh, but, but overall, that's, that's a myth. Uh, once your tank gets cleaned up, once your engine gets cleaned up, that's not an issue going forward. So there's, I think, also a, a misperception that you know, the engine manufacturers, uh, diesel technicians don't support, uh, you know, diesel uh, and obviously running travel centers. This is a, this is a big issue. And, and 10 years ago, um, this, this was probably true. There wasn't nearly as much OEM support then uh, as there is now. The National Biodiesel Board has done a tremendous job working with the OEMs uh, over the years uh, getting support. So, so today, all of the OEMs um, support uh, up to B5 blends. Uh, and nearly every single one of them um, supports uh, up to a B20. Uh, so that, that's simply an issue that we, we don't hear from OEMs on, on this issue uh, at all anymore. And, and then finally, and, and the industry helped create this misperception because uh, up, up until around 2007, 2008, nearly every gallon of biodiesel that was made in the U.S. was made from soybean oil. Um, the industry was relatively small. Soybean oil was readily available. Uh, it was inexpensive, and it was relatively easily to convert into high-quality biodiesel. Uh, ourselves and others recognized that as this industry grew to uh, a billion gallons, 1.5, 2 billion gallons and beyond, that we were going to need to be able to utilize lots of additional fats and oils to convert uh, into high-quality biodiesel. And we use lots of things today. We use inedible corn oil, which is a byproduct of ethanol production. We use used cooking oil from fast food restaurants uh, across the country. Uh, we continue to use soybean uh, and canola oil. All of those feedstocks can be converted uh, into high quality biodiesel um, if, if companies have made the uh, capital investment uh, in, in engineering uh, of their biodiesel plants uh, to make high quality biodiesel. So um, every gallon of biodiesel that, that we and nearly everybody sells at this point uh, does meet that uh, ASTM D6751 spec. There typically is a certificate of analysis that goes with each load of biodiesel. Um, so it's relatively easily for uh, travel centers, you know, to, to manage the, the cloud point and know exactly the quality of the fuel that they're buying today. So just one final thing I wanted to, to chat a, a bit about. Um, so, you know, five to 10 years ago, uh, just getting OEMs and fleets uh, to accept that biodiesel was was okay as a as a diesel substitute, that was was really the challenge at, at hand that we were working with, um, and, and we've done a great job once again getting the OEM support and, and getting the fleets to understand that from a, a performance issue, you know, up to B20, you know, appears to be uh, identical to, to diesel fuel performance. We're actually getting lots of fleets reaching out to the industry today because they want to improve their greenhouse gas emission um, score, their, their carbon intensity footprint uh, as a company. Uh, a lot of companies, particularly fleets today, 
have a, you know, a director of sustainability or a chief sustainability officer, uh, and that individual recognizes that, you know, integrating biofuels, particularly biodiesel, uh, that has a very good carbon footprint score uh, is a great way uh, to improve that, that company's uh, overall sustainability performance. So uh, that's a big trend that, that we're seeing that we think is going to continue to grow. So, so finally, um, you know, David made this point uh, at the beginning. Um, the national travel center chains were certainly the first to integrate um, biodiesel uh, at, at their operations um, across the, the country, uh, and they've, they've done and continue to do uh, a, a great job, but it's it's not just for uh, national travel centers. It's it's for regional and and independent folks that might have uh, you know just a couple or only one uh, operation. So I just wanted to talk quickly about petroleum wholesale um, travel center company uh, located uh, in Texas, uh, distribute fuel nine states. Um, they have 40 travel centers, uh, C stores across the country. Uh, first started uh, in biodiesel in 2013 uh, at their Texas locations to take advantage of that Texas incentive. Um, today, 95% of the locations offer up to B20 uh, year round. And, and once again, this was a green decision for them, you know, the green of, of, of economics, uh, and they just found it to be, uh, you know, a way to improve their profitability across the board. So I'm gonna wrap up just with two or three slides, uh, an overview of, of REG. So we've, we've been in this space uh, since 1996. Um, have tremendous uh, experience, uh, obviously, um, producing biodiesel, uh, have a great deal of production capacity. We're actually uh, over 500 billion gallons now. Uh, we do have national logistics capabilities. Uh, we can supply biodiesel uh, basically everywhere when we have, everywhere in the U.S. Uh, except for Alaska, and that's the one state we haven't supplied uh, as of yet. Uh, and we've got a, a big team in place. Uh, you know, a technical team, uh, a national sales team uh, can help you understand uh, the state incentives, uh, the engineering requirements to, to put in biodiesel tanks. Uh, got a dedicated team out there to help answer any questions that you guys might have uh, around biodiesel. Um, so just a quick overview of, of what our footprint looks like in terms of distribution. So the, the 12 green boxes represent uh, biorefineries, um, biodiesel and, and one renewable diesel uh, refinery uh, across the country. Uh, the blue boxes represent terminals where we're either selling neat biodiesel, B5 to B20 blends, or in some cases primarily in the Northeast, um, we're offering straight uh, number two LSD. Uh, and, and once again, we do have a full product offering today, which is different than we had in the past historically up until a couple of years ago. We only sold neat biodiesel. Um, today, we are able to offer um, B5 to B20 blends uh, to our customers uh, in a lot of locations across the country. Uh, so just finally, we, we do have a national sales team in place. Um, if, if you want to learn more specifically uh, about what you can do to integrate biodiesel into your operations, I um, would suggest that you start with me and we can have an initial uh, uh, phone conversation. Um, then likely would hand that off to one of our sales managers, um, you know, have the face-to-face -face meeting uh, and really discuss uh, your individual situation. So Amy and David, I'm going to wrap up with uh, that and then turn it back over to you. I see you guys have been uh, texting me during the thing with some of the uh, questions that got in. Uh, but Amy, if you want to facilitate asking those, I think David and I can address them. You bet. We got a ton of great questions. We'll, we'll give David the first one. Will the Trump administration have any negative effects on the biodiesel market? Oh, uh, okay. I think I'd like John to, to hear John's take on that as well. But um, my my initial impression is that I think right now it's too early to say necessarily. I think certainty is good for the biodiesel market and uncertainty is bad for the biodiesel market. And so far, there's been, I think, a little bit more uncertainty than uh, I think would have been ideal. Uh, and, and most of this surrounds what I addressed earlier, which is, an effort to kind of change the compliance structure of the renewable fuel standards so that uh, entities who purchase product downstream at the rack would become obligated uh, under the RFS as opposed to refiners. And what that would do as a practical matter 
is it would really eliminate a lot of the incentives that NASA members currently have to buy and incorporate biodiesel into their product supply. Um, so I think it, it, if and when the Trump administration affirmatively rejects the proposals to do that, it will m allow all of us to rest a little easier. I think as long as that concept is lingering out there, um, then it would be difficult to, to really say for certain whether or not the Trump administration will be good or bad for biodiesel. Um, kind of a, the, the next layer of this is every year EPA proposes what they want the volume mandates to be uh, for, the, for the future, for the subsequent year. Uh, right now we know what the biodiesel mandates will be through 2018 and, and we know what the other mandates will be through this year. Um, but usually in the early part of the summer, late June, is when EPA comes out with what their high-level thinking is for what they're going to require uh, in terms of blending mandates in the future. Um, and I think uh, when we see those numbers, we'll have a much better sense of how aggressive and ambitious the Trump administration will be. Um, uh, so long answer, uh, uh, short answer is it's too early to say, um, but I do think that, you know, four or five months from now, we'll have a much better sense of everything. You know, the, the fact of the matter is the constituencies that propel Donald Trump into office tend to be um, in parts of the country, think Iowa, uh, a lot of the Midwest, um, that really rely on strong renewable fuels incentives. Um, so provided Mr. Trump remains attuned to those political realities, and is able to um, push aside some of the um, uh, kind of less noble approaches to governing, I'll say, um, then I think we'll, we'll be in good shape. But at this point, it's just too early to say. Does that sound about right to you, John? What do you think? Yeah, I just add a little color to that. So yeah, generally, I, I agree with everything that, that David just said, and, and I was gonna start with the last point that you made. So if, if you look at the uh, Electoral College and the red states that um, propelled um, President Trump's victory. Uh, it was a lot of places like Iowa and lots of places that have ethanol uh, and biodiesel uh, production. Um, so I think he, he recognizes that. Uh, we sit here in Iowa, which has the first in the nation caucus status. Um, so then candidate Trump spent a great deal of time uh, here in Iowa. Uh, I think he recognizes the importance of ethanol and, and biodiesel. Um, to the, the, the states and this region's uh, overall uh, economy uh, and is supportive. And I think the other thing that we've seen as, as generally supportive is he is, you know, the point of obligation is, is uh, you know, up, up for debate at this point, um, but President Trump uh, has affirmed that he supports the renewable fuel standard and actually uh, 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 EPA Administrator Pruitt um, has said that as well. And I think the other thing we're excited about is uh, if you look at President Trump's emphasis on American jobs and American manufacturing, um, we think there's a reasonable chance that uh, we'll move from a blender's tax credit to a producer's tax credit where the, the tax credit would, would only be eligible to uh, domestic production uh, rather than, than foreign production. Um, and, and we think that would tend to be good for the industry as well. So yeah, it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag, I think, Overall, the trend is in the right direction. We'll know more in three to six months. Just to follow up on that, uh, REG is a very good friend of NETSA. Uh, John is a very good friend of mine. We, we agree on virtually everything. Um, where the tax credit should be is one of the few areas where we disagree. Um, NATSO has, has been advocating for keeping it at the blender level um, because we think that that's the best way to ensure that all areas of the country can um, have access to biodiesel at a, at a, at a you know, at a, at a cost that makes sense. Um, but, but look, I think, I think overall it's a fair point that he makes, which is that the renewable fuel standard in general is one that is designed to uh, help um, domestic renewable fuel industries, um, and, and to the extent Trump is serious about a lot of his 
pronouncements in that respect, you would think that he would uh, do all he can to to maintain it. Yeah, I, th I think that's all well said, David. Agree. All right, we'll dive into the other question. What are the issues with putting a B10 or 20 into an underground storage tank that has never had bio? Does the tank need to be cleaned? So uh, I, I, I want to look at the tank. Uh, I mean, just as a, a good tank maintenance uh, should, should probably be, be cleaned and looked at uh, on an annual basis for, for every couple of years. But if, if you've done that tank maintenance, um, I, the simple answer is, is no. Um, it'd be fine to put B5, B10, B15, B20 uh, into that tank. Um, you'd likely want to clean your filters um, uh, more frequently because uh, the solvency properties of biodiesel are going to, you know, clean up some of that, that gunk that just formed uh, over time. But, no, we have, we have customers do that all the time. The one thing we do encourage is that uh, in that scenario, maybe to start with a B5 um, for the first three or four weeks uh, to start getting the tank cleaned out before you go up to a B10, B15, B20, uh, better to start with a lower blend uh, and work your way up. The, the more biodiesel you have in there, um, the, the, the quicker the solvency uh, properties are, are going to take, take effect. Okay. Will a customer with an above-ground, uninsulated, uninsulated, blended biodiesel tank have any issues with storing fuel during winter months? Should they treat it with winter additives like they would a normal number two diesel? So it depends where the tank's at. So we sit here in Iowa, and one of the strong advocates of biodiesel in the state of Iowa is the Iowa Department of Transportation. And they have, at a number of their locations, exactly what you had to operate their snow plows. Um, they have diesel tanks, uh, above ground storage uh, outside, and they do not use B20 uh, in the wintertime. Uh, they dial it, it back. Um, so it, it depends on your climate. Um, so the answer might be yes. It might be the fact you want to make sure you're, you're utilizing a, a low cloud biodiesel uh, with an additive. I'd want to know what the uh, cloud point of the base diesel fuel uh, that you're mixing that uh, into. Um, but that would certainly be a consideration um, that you'd, you'd want to be careful of. Uh, also depends on how quickly you're turning your tanks over. One of the issues that the DOT here in Iowa has uh, is, you know, if it doesn't snow, fuel can sit in those tanks for, for weeks uh, before it's needed. Um, if you're turning and recirculating your tanks uh, quickly, uh, that's much easier to, to manage. So um, that would be a one-on-one -on -one discussion uh, with you individually to talk about your situation, but it's certainly manageable. Okay, we got a bunch more. <laughs> what are the issues with bacteria, algae, and biodiesel? Does biodiesel require biocide additives? So biodiesel doesn't specifically require biocide uh, additives, but what we see is there's an affinity to biodiesel and, and water. Uh, and when you have water present, um, that's when you tend to see uh, algae bloom or, or that type of activity. Uh, and in those scenarios, um, you know, a biocide is, is required. So the biocide isn't specific to, to the biodiesel, but um, biodiesel and water naturally adhere to each other. Um, so it, it just becomes more obvious uh, when you put biodiesel in a tank uh, with water, uh, and, and that's where you tend to see people, you know, need to be able to put a biocide if, if they've got water in their tank. Okay. All right. Is CloudPoint effective in a B5, B20 blend? So ask that again, Amy. Is cloud point affected in a B5, B20 blend? Yeah, so, so the cloud point of biodiesel can range from minus one, minus two degrees Celsius uh, up to 15 degrees um, Celsius, depending on the feedstock um, that, that is being utilized. Um, so we, we sell biodiesel um, in different products with those ranges. So it's, it's strictly a function of, of math. So if you start with a low cloud point biodiesel, let's say a zero degree cloud point biodiesel, and you're mixing that 5% bio with 95% diesel fuel, in that scenario, you got to do the math, but it's a very modest, maybe half to one to one and a half degree Celsius increasement in the overall uh, cloud point uh, of the fuel. 
So as, as you use a higher cloud point biodiesel and go to higher blends, there's a bigger impact. And then the other question we always ask our, our customers is, hey, by the way, what's the cloud point of the diesel fuel that you're starting with? So it's strictly a function of math. It's easy to calculate. We do that with all of our travel center customers uh, in terms of managing their blend levels and then what we are supplying them in terms of the cloud point of, of the neat biodiesel uh, on an annual basis. All right, what micron filter is needed for bio? Yeah, so that, this is getting a bit beyond my area of expertise. So the, the, the micron filter I'm most familiar with that people use at dispensers, I believe is a 10 micron filter. Um, let me do a bit more research on, on that, Amy. I'll, I'll get you a specific answer um, from one of our technical folks uh, and I get think back to that. John, the, the, as I understand it, the National Conference on Weights and Measures currently requires a 30 micron filter. Right. Um, isn't that right? And there, and there was an effort to move it down to 10 that, ha, that has not uh, been implemented yet. I, I don't know if there are individual state requirements, but the, the national type standard that I am most familiar with is a 30 micron filter. So yeah, once again, David, this, this isn't my area of expertise. I, I, I know just from working with a number of our customers, a lot of them have 10 micron filters, but um, let, let me do a little diligence with our technical folks to get a, get a better answer than that. Okay, sorry, I know I'm surprising you with these. There's one more detail question, which is, what is the price difference between buying ULSD and B20 from REG or any other fuel supplier? Yeah, so the, the, the best example I can share with you today is the one that I showed for uh, Iowa. So uh, that was at a, at a buck 60 per gallon. I think rack price for, for diesel fuel was the rack price three or four days ago at our at, at Magellan in, uh, in, in Iowa. Um, so our, our B100 price FOB plant uh, 20 miles uh, up the road um, was 125 over, was 285. Um, left the value of RINs was a buck fifty. Um, basically, I think we're showing uh, around twenty five cents a gallon cheaper um, a few days ago, uh, based on a, a dollar per gallon RIN. And I'd have to look at our at our B twenty prices, but uh, our our blended fuel prices uh, tend to be um, a couple of cents a gallon cheaper B ten B fifteen B twenty uh, than our straight number two ULSD price uh, at the rack. Um, basically demonstrating the fact that, you know, biodiesel uh, does have better ground economics than diesel fuel. So if people want specific answers for that at specific locations across the country, have them, have them reach out to me. Okay. Um, are we, are the slides going to be available if people want them emailed or we can put them on the website? Yeah, yeah. so I think, I think you've got those from our agency, Amy, so yeah, go ahead and put them on your website, absolutely. Okay. Um, we got one more that came in. What incentives do you see in using biodiesel for the agriculture industry? Um, for agriculture specifically, um, I can't think of, of any. I've, I've got my director of marketing here with me. Troy, is there any that you could think of? Uh, as far as incentives, like like uh, monetary incentives, none specifically, but obviously there's all the, the incentives uh, to an agricultural producer to use uh, renewable fuel uh, based on, uh, on, on pro products and crops that they grow themselves. So uh, biodiesel returns economics back to uh, farmers in ways of, of creating greater value for the products that they produce. So um, in that essence, there's significant incentive. Yeah, that's, that, that's exactly right. And, and if you look at at least, you know, row crop uh, ag production, uh, states like Iowa, Illinois, and Minnesota, and Minnesota um, all do have either state incentives or, or state requirements for biodiesel in place today. Okay. You know, I'm 100% putting you on the spot here, but because we're getting so many good questions, do you think it's worth just talking for a minute or two about what people could expect to learn um, at the few food and fuel tour in July? It's July 19th is when we're doing the biodiesel portion. I think if you could just briefly go over sort of what you, like big picture, what you think people can get out of it. Yeah, no, th thanks, Amy. So once again, Amy and I both plugged this uh, at, at the beginning, and we're going to post this on the NASA website. So we, we, we think we're going to get 35 to, to 40 um, 
uh, travel center representatives uh, at, at this tour. Uh, it'll fill up quickly, so if you are interested, uh, go ahead and, and sign up. But you know, we're we're going to do a, a deep dive on biodiesel blending economics, um, uh, talking about the, the value of RINs, uh, how you could trade RINs, what what companies are out there uh, to assist you with those type of, of services. Um, we're going to do a, do a deep dive and likely bring in uh, one of the biodiesel blending system companies that can show you in real life. So you know, here's here's what sort of tank and tank configuration we're looking at. Here's how you'd link it into your uh, existing infrastructure. Um, this is what the telemetry equipment looks like. Uh, this is what the blending system looks like. You know, this is roughly what your your cost might be. So uh, a deep dive on that. Uh, there's going to be an ability for folks to actually physically tour uh, a biodiesel plant outside of Chicago, um, see the operations, see the quality of the fuel, see how we make the fuel, uh, really understand the, the fuel specifications that the industry has, uh, and then we'll talk um, more specifically about uh, our more stringent uh, fuel specifications. And then a great opportunity to visit uh, in person. Uh, I believe it's going to be one, if not two, travel centers that have made the capital investment and made the decision uh, to integrate biodiesel into their operations, get a talk to that uh, uh, owner, uh, I believe in most cases, about how they made that decision, what it cost them, what the payback has been. So you won't just be hearing it from REG from the biodiesel producer, you'll be hearing it actually from independent NATSO members that have made these decisions on their own and learn from them what the financial impact was. And then, Amy, if you guys want to talk a bit more about uh, what we're going to do in, in Chicago on, on the retail side, that'd be great. Oh, sure. So on the next day, we're going to visit food service innovators in Chicago, not in the truck stop industry. Um, I don't know if people have been to Eadley. And I think we're going to go to a Walgreens, which is actually doing great things in food service. Um, yeah, sort of seeing people who are pushing the envelope on food in, like I said, not in the truck stop industry. It's going to be a great event. It is, I did add it to the calendar today. So if folks want to, um, there's a little sign up form. So if you're interested in getting information once we officially launch the registration, that's on the calendar section on our website or just natso.com slash food and fuel. Fantastic. Thanks, Amy. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. I'm, I've, we've got so many great questions. I hope everyone got a lot out of it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.